Welcome to Trinity Central. We exist to make God central to our lives and our world. You are listening to a recording of one of our Sunday messages. For more information, please go to trinitycentral.org. So, so good to be here. Um, We're here uh, because we love the Whitmers. And we just love that the Whitmers have connected with the Scots. And so Steve and uh, Becky Whitmer uh, said, you, you have to come up. This is like your church back home in Visalia. It just happens to be in Vancouver. You, you have to meet these people. And so I said, upon Steve's invitation, I said, yeah, I'm coming. I can't <laughs> wait. I can't wait. I've had a couple phone calls with Reese, and I'm getting to know uh, what's happening here and who's happening here. Um, and then, then, it, then I found out Bo and Alexis were going. And I thought, I'm flying to Seattle. We'll drive from Seattle together with Bo and Alexis because there's nothing better than time with Bo and Alexis. So I've planned this whole trip without telling Reese that I'm coming. <laughs> so I bought airfare. I, I'm coming to Thirst. I, don't, I didn't know I would speak. I didn't necessarily want to speak, um, but here I am. Um, I, was, I was fairly thirsty for uh, something to be out where I didn't speak. That's what I was thirsty for. But, so I, I, it just dawns on me, I've not told anyone at Trinity Central that I'll be attending their retreat. So I sent, uh, I sent an email to Reese. I just said, I did it, man. And he was, and I said, I, I, I bought airfare. I'm coming. Can I come? You know? And uh, he said, yes. So uh, my wife reminded me this morning that we have a history in British Columbia. Uh, as a 19-year-old, I went with my youth group. Um, I was kind of that kid who was off and on, I would attend the summer camp. I wasn't a part of the youth group over the course of the year, but during that summer trip, wherever that trip was headed, I was going to go uh, with them. So this year I had just graduated from uh, high school and the youth group, which was uh, led by a lovely man named Tim Ainley, was always headed to some, it, it wasn't the typical camp. He never took us to typical places. Um, we were headed as a youth group to Hastings Street in Vancouver. We were going to uh, participate in what they were up to in that, it was like a red light district. Yeah, I can tell by the, like the gasp that <laughs> this wasn't a place you want your kids headed. Um, but we, we ministered with a street church there, uh, but before we went there, uh, there was actually a conference that took place on Vancouver Island uh, in Campbell River. So that is where I, as a 19-year-old, surrendered to Jesus as Lord. So I got saved uh, in, on Vancouver Island. And uh, the stories, uh, it's actually even more exciting than that. I'll tell it just as a glimpse into my life and where I've come from. But uh, as we were driving up, I was quite sick. Um, I'm not now by the way, (laughs) Uh, but uh, that time I was, Um, and uh, we got to the conference, and the conference was um, really quite charismatic, quite demonstrative, two things I was quite uncomfortable with, and so I remember, because I grew up in kind of skate and snowboard and surf culture, I remember um, acting like I didn't care what people thought but was completely gripped by the fear of man. So watching people be demonstrative in their worship was really unsettling uh, for me. So I sat in the back. I sat in the back of this conference and continued um, to get sicker and sicker as the days went on. So finally the camp nurse uh, took me to like a a walk-in clinic Um, where I was told, because there were white abscesses kind of in my mouth and throat, and I was struggling to swallow. So I was having to drink in order to swallow. So finally, the camp nurse uh, took me to a clinic where I was told I had mono, 
and they said, you need to fly this kid home. And I remember getting in the car with the camp nurse and my youth uh, leader and driving home, um, driving back to the camp where they were going to then fly me home. And I said, before I go back, before they fly me home, I want to have that guy who was speaking pray for me. And they said, well, that's, that's fine. Sure, when we get back to camp, we'll have him pray for you and pray for your healing. And I said, thanks. And I'm just gazing out the side of the window, and we pass like a Subway sandwich shop, and I see the speaker like saying, I'll have spinach. You know, he's pointing, <laughs> moving down the line. And uh, I said, I... I think that guy's supposed to pray for me, the speaker at the camp. And they said, yeah, we know you already said that to us. And I said, no, I think he's supposed to pray for me now because right after I said it, I looked out the window and I saw him in a sandwich shop, um, which for a person who was completely gripped by the fear of man was a, a real big thing for me to want to go into a public place, into a restaurant and have these guys pray for me. So I walked into the restaurant with... Just a, total, just a total sense of what God was going to do. And I went to tell this guy that I'm sick and they're going to send me home. Would you pray for me? And I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. Because I think I had a sense of what God was going to do. And so they, of course, are not gripped by the fear of man, so they stand up and start praying loudly in <laughs> tongues in the middle of a subway, you know. To the point where the only thing I can remember from this prayer time in the sandwich shop was some lady going, what are you doing to that boy? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember being really, really vocal with like, because at, at this time, um, this is like late 90s. Um, so it was common in a charismatic church for people to get prayed for and fall over. Has anyone ever seen that happen? Anyone ever fallen over? Well, I was determined if I'm going to fall over, no one's going to touch me. That was, that was my stance, right? And if that guy prays for me, I'm going to kind of dig in. You know, I'm not going over. Um, I'm in a subway, and I'm, I'm going over. Like, they're going to lay me down on that dirty tile floor. And, uh, you know, they prayed for my healing for a little bit. Um, but they prayed for my future a lot. And they prophesied over me that the testimony of this healing was going to have a certain impact in my friend group. Um, as I didn't, I wasn't hanging out with the... I didn't have... Uh, very many like good influences in my life. So anyway, I head back home to Visalia. I end up sharing my testimony and I end up uh, preaching at a party uh, and there's a response. A few uh, friends and I started to have, I started to host a Bible study with those who responded to my testimony at a party. And uh, <clears throat> I've, been, I've been preaching ever since. And uh, sometimes, a lot of the times, I've wanted to stop. <laughs> I just... Yeah. And in some ways, I think I feel emotional because, like, a lot has changed. And then, really, like, nothing has changed. And um, I'm still interested in the same things. And I'm still running my mouth. And I'm still uh, leading. And uh, God's been faithful to me for a lot of years. I, um, I have a, a family 
uh, back home. Sorry, thanks for going with me down memory lane. It's glad, I'm glad to be in Vancouver. And uh, glad to be with this family. And so, Stephen Becky, Stephen Becky told me it would feel like family, and, and it does. And, uh, and there's uh, so many pluses to feeling at home. Um, but one of the minuses will be that I'll go long preaching. <laughs> when, I, <laughs> when you feel comfortable uh, someplace, I'm, I can't even guarantee what's going to come out of my mouth now. <laughs> when you don't know people and you don't feel comfortable, I'm on my best behavior, you know, and my sermon's 35 minutes and has three points. And then you get amongst friends and family and you just, uh, you just share, you know, <laughs> you just keep sharing. So <laughs> this is my family. I know John, who served us so well last night, said you don't go to the Grand Canyon and think about yourself. But here we are at the Grand Canyon. <laughs> The biggest, most important thing here is my family. <laughs> yeah. What a marvelous creation this family is. I have five uh, daughters. My oldest, yeah. <laughs> my oldest is is 15, she is very close to getting a driver's license and very close to getting a boyfriend. And so I am very close to losing it. So, <laughs> and my youngest is uh, Ruby and uh, she's eight years old. So anyway, that's our uh, family. Um, and the, the church family that I lead, I don't have a photo of that family, but uh, the church family uh, that I lead, um, we planted a church in Visalia in 2005, not as a part of New Frontiers or any of the spheres or branches that have come out of New Frontiers, um, but just alone with a group of friends very excited about uh, planting a church. And so we adopted into Confluence um, uh, eight years ago now um, as a result of a, a good visit from Bo and Alexis. And it's, uh, it's really changed the game for us uh, to belong to something bigger than ourselves. I think we all know what it's like to get um, so focused on what we're doing and lose sight of the big picture. And so that kind of big picture has saved us from a lot of trouble as a church plant. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're excited uh, to be here. I was thinking about the, um, <laughs> I was thinking about the, the name of this time, this conference called Thirst. And I was thinking last night, like, I'm really thirsty for Jesus. I, I really am. And, and the worship team and John did such a good job of exalting Christ. And he was just drawing our hearts to himself. That's what was happening for me last night. I also just am really, I was really thirsty to, to, to just travel. I mean, it's really good to be here uh, with you, but I would be anywhere with anyone at this point. <laughs> I, I was so, I mean, is anybody else just glad to be out? Like, I... I just, you know, what do you want me to do? Yeah, I'll do it because I just, I need to leave. Like, my house, I need to leave my church. I need to get out. So I, I am like genuinely thirsty for Jesus. And then I've been really thirsty for rhythm. Been really thirsty um, for consistency. I've been really craving certainty. Um, I'm, I'm craving to not plan in pencil. Yeah. Like, I want to write something in blood somewhere <laughs> and just know that, like, this is what I'm going to do no matter what. You know, I, I've really been craving those things. I, yesterday, even as I came through your border, I just thought I hate our post-COVID kind of reality. 
I, I want, I'm, I'm, I'm thirsty, I'm craving simplicity, I think. That's it. Like, I just honestly want comfort, and I want something easy, and everything's been so complex, and I just crave uh, simplicity. That's what I find myself uh, thirsty for. And so it's an interesting dilemma, isn't it, when you, like, want something, and then underneath that want, there's something else that you really want. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, I want to lose weight, and then I also really want those waffles, like <laughs> four of them, you know? And you're in that war of wants, you know? And I had waffles, a lot of them, so. I, but I say I want to lose weight, but what I really want is waffles. And that's just true, you know? And then I say I want Jesus. Like I'm thirsty for him. I am. I really do. I mean that. And then I really want to look good, to be right, and to stay comfortable. But I keep saying I want Jesus. But what I really want seems to be a sabotaging that. So I want to bring a word that I hope is just an exhortation um, that brings simplicity to this really complex time. Uh, and then I, I really want to get to a response. That's what I see in my heart and mind is a certain response this morning. So I'm going to try to get us to uh, what... I see. I started to dream about the fall in the spring. Anybody else start to project like maybe the coast will be clear? Maybe we'll be here doing something uh, like this. I started to get so excited about what I saw um, ahead. I don't know if any of you have seen the memes uh, flying out around that, that kind of um, give us a good laugh about what the Delta variant intended to do to your fall. These are, these are like hilarious, though. Oh, I... <laughs> above above uh, the couple that says, my fall plans, and then uh, above... Uh, Fraulein Maria, it says the Delta variant. <laughs> Maybe we can get, do we have one that actually has it? There we go. This is, uh, so good. That's an iceberg. There's another one with Leo in it. Was the Revenant? <laughs> that is good right there. That is real good. Oh, man. Oh, that's the Princess Bride. It's a little dark, but uh, anyways, you can either like laugh or cry, but I'd just rather laugh about it. One more. Is there any more? Okay, great. Thanks. Anyway, you might want to. <laughs> As I started to get really excited about my fall, I started to also fret because I started to feel very vulnerable the more excited I got about my plans. I started to sense that the rug might be pulled out from underneath me. Anyone ever feel like being excited is a bit really vulnerable place to be? In fact, cynicism's really safe. It's a really safe place to live. Your, a sad place to live your life, but a safe place to live your life, because you always see it coming when you're a cynic, right? So I started obsessing about creating a future that was kind of pandemic-proof. I started obsessing, I've been thinking a lot, this is what I've been thinking a lot about. I've been thinking a lot about a fall that is pandemic-proof and politician-proof. I have. Yeah, you, you know our governor, <laughs> yes. Okay, you understand where I'm coming from. 
But uh, our, our governor kind of narrowly escaped recall just last week. And so in California, we've been living in, with a lot of questions and a lot of uh, wondering. And so I found myself going, I'm not going to be caught off guard, not this time. That may have happened last time, but not this time. This time, I want to build something that can't be messed with. I want to be sure of something. I want to be certain of something. I want something pandemic proof. I want something politician proof. As I lead forward, I want to be able to say we're going to do this and I want to be uh, confident that we're going to be able to pull this off because no one wants to be teased right now, right? Our thirst for consistency is at an all-time high. Our thirst for something to be sure of or confident in is really high right now. So I don't want to tease my church saying this is where we're headed and then not head there. I want a fall that I can count on. And let's be honest, we don't just want a fall that we can count on. We crave certainty and control in every season. Even pre-COVID, even pre-pandemic, we crave control. It's what we want. You know, not what we say we want. No one says that. But that is what we really want. And that is what's being really exposed in many of our lives. We hate, not just in this season. We hate uncertainty in every season. We hate the unknown. So many people are gripped with a fear of death. But I don't actually think it's a fear of death. I think it's a fear of the unknown. And it's a fear of uncertainty that grips us. We hate that. We're always attempting to predict, think through all the possible scenarios in order to not be caught off guard, right? We started as a family looking for a new uh, car. We have a car with over 200,000 miles on it. So the transmission went out and I just thought, are we going to, am I going to put thousands of dollars into this old car with you know, this many miles, or are we just going to put old Yeller down? We're just going to shoot her and move on. So I started car shopping, only to find out now that, like, it's seven-year financing for a, a vehicle, and it's like the price of a mortgage. Like, it's insane. And so I, I, I put the transmission in my old car. But I remember thinking through, I was like, seven years, and I started thinking, Tiff, seven years from now, you're not going to need a Suburban. Seven years from now, this many of our kids are actually going to be driving, so we shouldn't necessarily pay for this because I don't think you'll be driving this a decade uh, from now. And I started like measuring my kids, like if Finley grows at a rate of two and a half inches for the next five years, this back seat is still going to work for her, you know, because I, I don't want to make a dumb decision. We're always trying to predict what the future holds. And look, I think planning is wise. I do. I think scheduling is stewardship. It really is worship. I think counting the costs is absolutely biblical. But sometimes, can we just admit that much of it is an attempt to save our own rears? That in counting the cost, we may be really attempting to control and refusing to trust, refusing to embrace or accept the reality that we don't know. I don't know where, where we'll be or what we'll be driving seven years from now. And that is what we do know, is that I don't know and I wish I did. So this is problematic as a leader. I had to get up in front of my church and say, it's the fall, every fall. This is my job as the, the lead guy to stand up in about August, September, and essentially say, charge. We're going to take this hill together. But obviously, this is a really uncertain time, and people are living with large questions, right? So I didn't want to get up in front of my church and make these really bold, presumptuous statements about where we're headed that we're just completely out of touch with the reality that people were hurting, needed some love. 
And then at the same time, I didn't want to stand up in front of them and be like, well, I really don't know where we're headed. And uh, anyway, no one wants to sign up for that. So, so I was like, Lord, I'm really in a pickle here because I don't want to be an idiot. Like I, I walked through the last couple of years. It's very presumptuous to say I know where we're headed. And then at the same time, I don't want to back down. I don't want to be timid. I don't want my confidence to be stolen in this time. And I can't lead like that. I just can't. So because we are struggling with uncertainty and because maybe I'm struggling to be the man with the plan, <laughs> like uh, I've, tr I've tried a couple times to be that guy. It's just not working right now. But I just was struggling. So I started, I opened the Bible and I started to look to the man with the plan, right? I started to look at Jesus. I started to behold him as John was talking about. And I started to look at how did you cast vision? And what did you say uh, to people? And how did you communicate your plan? And how did you enroll people into your plan? And what did you say you were going to do when you said uh, charge? And, and once again, I just stumbled upon the brilliance of Jesus. And I just want to share with you three very familiar passages and then call us to respond. Because this really helped me. Listen, <laughs> the only way to pandemic-proof or to politician-proof your fall is to follow him. Yeah. Okay, Trav, like, now what, though? Like, now what's the plan, you know? No, like, the only way to pandemic proof, politician proof, your fall is to follow him. And he promised he would lead us, and he promised he would be with us. The first one I, I want to turn to is just before Matthew uh, 17. Really, anyone planning on following Jesus, like if that's what you're planning on ultimately, then you should plan on doing these things. You should plan on these things being a part of your fall. You should plan on these things being a part of your next year, your next step. If you're going to follow him, he said, do the following, basically. Basically. And these are really pivotal moments with his followers where he casts vision for what the future holds. And it is genius. Matthew 16, John said it last night. This is the moment where everything in Matthew changes. Right here at Matthew 16, 17. Is, it's been one story leading up to it. And then Jesus starts to turn towards the cross. And the book completely pivots right here at this moment. But the first thing you should be planning on doing if you're planning on following Jesus and you want to pandemic proof and politician proof your fall is that you should come after him. You should follow him. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, as again, everything's pivoting. The game is changing. This is a moment where he's casting vision and enrolling them into what he's about to do. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself. They must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and he will reward each person according to what they have done. If you are coming after Jesus, here's what you must do. You must deny yourself. If you're coming after Jesus, 
You should plan on dying to yourself and taking up your cross, which is a symbol of death. Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously said, when Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. And can we all just admit for a second that we're no good at this? Yeah. I mean, I, let me speak as an American. None of us were in Tokyo for self-denial. Yeah. That's not what we're known for. None of us would, 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 would maybe plan on being platformed as an example of denying oneself. Right now in our culture... In the West, in fact, I would say this concept of self-denial is considered dangerous. This is the ultimate sin in our culture would be to not follow your heart. That's it. It's the worst thing you could do with your life is not follow your heart. How many films have we watched where the person has the, the courage to follow their heart and walk out of the marriage? How many Disney films have we seen where over the course of the story we learn that all the child's dreams were misguided and actually the parents were not mean and they were not crusty, but they were wise and experienced. And that was the point of the story. We've been groomed in this. We've been formed in this. That you should, in self-esteem, speak your truth, follow your heart, be true to yourself, follow your dreams, find yourself, march to the beat of your own drum. And because of that, for us in particular, denying oneself is really, really difficult. It's also difficult for us because we've been groomed and grown in this digital technology which is absolutely rewiring our brains. We're being rewired for immediate gratification. I mean, if it can't be primed, I can't wait. I'm probably not going to purchase it if I can't get it in a matter of days. We're being completely rewired and our patience, our ability to deny ourselves, the long suffering has been greatly affected by. In our town, we just got a new fast food restaurant that has a two-lane drive through have you ever seen this? It's like it wasn't fast enough. Like build a highway into this fast food restaurant. The drive through needs multiple lanes. Let's make it happen. This fast food is not fast enough. I stumbled on this quote that says, we've been led to believe that the self is sacrosanct, which means so essential that it can't be pushed aside. Just as in earlier time it was thought never fitting to deny God, now it seems never right to deny oneself. It's never right to deny oneself. Self is the new God. And in the past, there's no way that someone would deny the existence of God. And now there's no way you should deny yourself. Notice here in this passage just a few things. One, there's only two options. Classic Jesus. No, no, no. It's more, it's more nuanced than that. No, no, no. You can come after me, deny yourself, or you can go for yourself and deny me. That's it. Dang it. There's not like a third more like, I don't know. Yeah, hybrid. <laughs> Notice in the, the passage that the only way this pencils out is if you have a view of the long tomorrow. If this life is all there is, by all means, don't live like this. Yeah. This is dumb. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you die. Don't do this. But, but if there's a life beyond this life, then there is reason and there is reward for short-term self-denial. And it will be short-term self-denial. It will be eclipsed one day. 
Notice that Jesus says to his disciples here, if anyone wants to be my disciple. That's kind of confusing, right? Jesus says to his disciples, hey, disciples, if anyone wants to be my disciple, it's as if he's saying, like, just because you've been this doesn't mean you're always going to be this. You need to constantly ask the question, am I coming after him? Am I actually following Jesus right now? And you need to know that if you're going to follow him, if you're following him in your fall, you can count on denying yourself. Plan on it. Write it in blood if you want. You will, if you follow him as his disciple, you will have to deny yourself and you'll have to take up a cross. Now, this may sound kind of strange or sick, but I started to get kind of excited. I was like, I could count on this. Like, I could put this in my planner. If you're going to come after him, if you're going to follow Jesus, you must, you must deny yourself. And so I just started thinking about, like, it doesn't matter who gets voted in. There's no one who will be voted into a place of power that will get you out of having to deny yourself because you've already voted him into power. You've sworn allegiance to someone who said to you, if you want to come after me, you must deny yourself. Now you can go after power, you can go after status, you can go after whatever, and you might not have to deny yourself. But if you're gonna come after him, if you're gonna come after Jesus, you must. And I just thought, this is brilliant. Jesus, you've cast a vision that works everywhere, in every age, in every language, in every culture, this works. I don't care how you arrange your small groups. You must, if you follow him, deny yourself. It's, a, it's, it's not an option. Wow. Strangely kind of freeing. Turn with me to another one real quick. These ones will be shorter. Sorry about that. Second one. He's at this really pivotal point. These are his, like, not just his red letters. These are, like, dead red letters. Like, I'm about to, I'm about to go. So this is dead red stuff here. And instead of giving him a bow, you can't laugh that loud. <laughs> he's laying out a plan. He's casting vision. He's enrolling his disciples into what's to come. And the plan is, remain in me. Well, what, when I go to India, Tom, my name's Thomas. When I go to India, and I, I don't speak the language, and uh, I'm probably going to face some difficulty there. What's the plan, you know? I want you to remain vitally connected to me. That's what I want. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers, and such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it'll be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love, I've told you this. So that my joy may be in you. And your joy may be complete. Like a drumbeat through this passage, remain in me, remain in me, remain in my love. You'll bear much fruit. Stay vitally connected to me. Draw life from me. You can remain in Christ. This is the good news. 
Again, this is genius. You might not remain in health. Our numbers might not remain low. Your boss might remain dumb. Like he may very well remain that way. You might not remain in that house. You might not remain in that job. You might not remain in that relationship. And the good news is you can remain in him. You can remain in Christ. How genius is this? It works in every country, in every age, in every culture. This is what connects us to the church in Afghanistan. Not our small group system or how we do worship. This is what connects us to them. This works. This works. You can remain in him in any and in every circumstance. Jesus paid a dear price to remain in you to where you now house and hold his very presence and where you go, he goes. And he was serious about making that a reality for us. Dead, red, serious. That this would be our reality going forward. Lastly, Reese read it. And, and again, I think it's, we've heard it so many times, I, I fear it's been lost on us. But this is the truth, that because people took Matthew 28 seriously, we're here thousands of years later in a far off country, in another language. Because people took serious this commission that came from Jesus, this moment where he cast vision, this moment where he said charge, this moment where he said, this is what's ahead for us. Go make disciples of me. Go do that. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, and when they saw him, they worshiped him. Some doubted. Gotta love the Bible. Some were like, I don't know. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I commanded you, and surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. I, again, I just, these are very simple passages. I mean, I, the, even this morning, I was like, I can't teach on that. Everyone knows these passages, and I would want to be like, I don't know, the guest speaker that like drew the gems out of, you know, some deep cut, you know, like, I'm not, I can't teach. You have to deny yourself and then go into all the world and make disciples. Like, we're over that, you know, we've moved on, you know. How genius is this? Two things to notice after I read those three passages. There is not a thing that Jesus invites us into or enrolls us into that is contingent upon our surroundings, our circumstances, or our government. All three of these things go down. They go down. I don't care who's in power. In sickness and in health, for better or for worse, these things go down. Listen, if our job is to deny ourselves and take up our cross, okay, got it? Remain vitally connected to me and make disciples. Oh, we have friends, what I like to call job security. That's job security. This never, this never stops. I don't care what language you speak, what culture you're in, what stage of life you're in. You can deny yourself and come after Christ. He'll take anybody who wants to do it. And then you can, 
remain vitally connected to him in every stage. Well, I don't speak the language. Doesn't matter. And you can make disciples. Will we be able to meet? I don't know. I honestly don't. I do know that this doesn't stop. And I don't know about you guys, but there's been times over the COVID where I've been doing a heck of a job of denying myself. And then there's been other times where I'm like, boy, I am far from that. And entitlement has crept in. I I just found myself like, I need to fast. You know, has anyone said that? Like, all of it, you know, media, food, bourbon, whatever. I need to fast it. (laughs) Now, you know, I don't know what I've been doing, but it's been the opposite of fasting, you know, <laughs> denying myself has not been part of it. So at times I've, I've kept that in check. And then at other times I'm completely out of touch with the reality that if you're going to follow him, you'll have to deny yourself. And it does not matter what politician is in power. Does it matter what's being mandated? He has already mandated that this is our reality. There is no future without denying ourselves. And at other times, I've stayed vitally connected to him. And at times, I've gotten really, really distracted, really caught up like a Martha and unable to even sit at his feet. At times, I've been like, yeah, I'm going to make disciples. And then at other times, I'm I'm like, if you take my programs, I literally don't know how to do this. If you take these formats from me, I don't know how to make disciples. And let me tell you this, like expectations are everything. I was told I was going camping. I was going to Vancouver to camp. And, uh, and then I showed up and I have like a hotel room. I was like, what? This is amazing. But if you would have told me you're going to the nicest hotel room you've ever been to, in Vancouver, and I got that, I'd be like, what? This is so sketchy. This is not staying in this dump, you know? I'm sorry. It's like staff here. This is all like I'm making a point right here. I'm just, (laughs) I'm being like, I'm evangelistically speaking right now. Okay, so I come home. Tiff will tell you this. I come home from work, and I have expectations. And my expectations are that my kids are going to be well-behaved, that there might be a a plan, at least a plan for a meal. Like, not dinner on the table, but just some idea, like, we're going to have this tonight. And, 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 And as I approach the house, I'm holding these expectations that maybe things are gonna be easier as I come through the door. And then of course, my kids, they don't care anything about my plans for the night. (laughs) They're so good at just destroying your plans, you know? (laughs) And so I come in and I'm frustrated because it's not going according to my plan. I thought the night was going to look like this. I thought the night was going to feel like this. And now I'm upset and I'm angry because it's not going according to plan. What if while walking up to my door, I was thinking, what I will have when I pass through this door is an opportunity to deny myself, to take up a cross, to follow him. What if I knew coming through the door that I could also remain vitally connected to him for what I need? instead of asking my 15-year-old daughter for it, which is not a good idea. (laughs) Tell me who I am. (laughs) What do you really think? (laughs) And then what if I thought coming through the door, I I know I'm going to have a shot to make a disciple tonight. I will. How that would change the way I come home how that would change the way you go to work, how that would change the way that we come to church. What we have 
When we go is an opportunity to deny ourselves, remain vitally connected to him, and make disciples. This is genius. This is genius. This is what connects us to the church globally. It absolutely is. It works anywhere, at any time. You know a false gospel when it only works some places. That's why the health and wealth stuff is garbage. It only works in a certain context. So we know that's not the gospel. That's like some twisting, some version. Well, how have we twisted and done a version here? Because this is it. We can always do the plan. Get your planner out. Pull your phone out. You can plan on this. Plan on denying yourself. You must. Plan on remaining in him. Plan on making disciples. Don't back off those things. Don't let entitlement creep in. Don't let distraction creep in. Don't let our meetings and our models creep in. We can do this. Historically, this is verifiably pandemic proof. This is historically verifiably politician proof. Nothing stops this from marching on if we live into this. I don't care. It's never been stopped. By pandemics far worse than this, it's never been stopped. By po politicians far worse than ours have never stopped this. Ideologies, communism, Marxism, nationalism, racism has never stopped this. Pestilence and plague has never stopped this. It's never been stopped. Death could not stop him. This can't be stopped. What will separate us? Or who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Will it be tribulation that separates us? A distress or a persecution, a famine that comes, a nakedness, a danger, a sword that comes against the church. No, 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 it won't stop this. It could stop our meetings in some ways. It could stop all kinds of stuff. It can't stop what Jesus said. And it can't stop the vision that he cast. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor the unknown things to come, no power, no height, no depth, nothing created will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I want to create, what time is it? The clock will stop this. I just, uh, I felt it would be right to create a moment here to just respond. And I do, I do want to, this is difficult to do, but if this is, and, and you don't have to do this just because you feel like bad for the new guy. So don't, don't do that. Don't like, wow, no one responded, so I guess I should go. I don't, it's just really not about me. It's about where we're at right now. And if, if while I've been talking like this, you've been gripped by the simplicity of this and you've been gripped by the reality that you've strayed from this. You're like, I've not remained. And I want to engage. If you've backed off this mandate to make disciples, if you've backed off this reality that we need to remain in him, and you've thought that somehow if you come after him, you won't have to deny yourself. I just want to open up like the altar because there's nothing special about the altar except for it just makes war on our pride that we have to come forward and admit our need. And God is really drawn to your humility and he like really can't stand your pride. So, so what I wanted to do and maybe like is just create a space up here to just come forward and say, here I am, Lord. These are three not so easy steps. I'm not saying like this is easy. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's simple and it can't be stopped. This is brutal. 
But if you just want to come forward and kneel down, yield your life to him again, I don't even know that we need uh, music for it because this is, it's actually not, there's nothing that makes this easier. <laughs> and, and definitely not a synth patch. Like, it just is rough, you know? <laughs> But I just thought we could come forward and say, here I am, Lord. I, I've strayed from this. At times I've done it, at times I've done, I, at times I haven't. But here I am, I'm freshly yours. And I can see the brilliance of what you're calling me to. And uh, I trust you uh, with it. And I don't want to try to save my own rear anymore. Um, so anyway, come forward if you want to do that. <laughs>